just so you know, you are part of an ongoing conversation we're having throughout the Southern California region. Uh, Harbor College is one of our proudest partners in the seven college uh, regional collaboration that is trying to promote career pathways into global trade, supply chain, logistics, and e-commerce. So that's why we are excited to give you an opportunity to hear from somebody who's living it and hopefully uh, is going to share with you some great insights. Uh, and rumor has it, he has access to companies that are looking for interns and potentially uh, even workers someday, right? So, <laughs> so please, please make sure you find Jay on your fo favorite social media because he could quickly become your friend. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and um, give you a, a real quick encapsulation. Unfortunately, the Jay's bio was so large that I was printing it and printing it and printing it and I ran out of ink, so I stopped printing it. So, <laughs> so, so Jay Sal is our proud uh, and, and, and we are very privileged to have him here at Harvard College. Uh, Jay wears many hats. He is an entrepreneur. He is an investor. He is an advisor. Uh, but most of all, today, he is going to be talking about the importance of the digital-based economy. So let's give Jay a round of applause and welcome him. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So as you can see, we're going to make this uh, as much of an informal conversation as we possibly can. Uh, we want this to be a highly interactive session. I know your time is short because you want to get back to, to classes. But uh, if, if we keep you from classes, you'll have a good excuse to tell your professor because you can say, I heard from an amazing speaker. Yeah. Right? No one wants to go back to classes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, don't, please don't follow our examples. Uh, my mantra was don't let classes get in the way of your education. Please. Professors in the room, avert your, your ears on that one. So, <laughs> so Jay, before uh, we get started in, in, in the lively debate discussion, um, I think a lot of our students are probably going, how did you begin your journey and get to this place in your life, being able to do all the cool things that I talked about? So if you can, just maybe give us a real quick acceleration of your, your life and journey and, and career experiences. Sure. So how many students in here? Okay, and the others are, are administrator or, or, or faculty. <clears throat> so I've always been an equal opportunity entrepreneur. I started my first business when I was 15 um, and started various businesses um, offline and online through the course of my career. And I don't mean to brag or boast, but all that means is I failed a lot. <laughs> um, so there's a mantra in entrepreneurism, and, and that is fail early, fail fast. Um, because you learn more from your failures than your successes. And um, I've, you know, throughout my path, I've, I've you know, dabbled in, in private equity and finance. Um, but I've always had a passion for technology. And I've al al always had a passion for international trade. Um, so my background, family's background, were all in Asia. So we did, um, they did a lot of, you know, manufacturing and contract manufacturing of, of various type of products. And I've always been fascinated by, um, consumer products. So I'm a big products guy. I love to look at, you know, hunt for trends and look at um, voids in the marketplace and figure out a way to fill that void. Um, so an opportunistic play in terms of, uh, in, in terms of meeting consumer demand. And um, have always been interested in, you know, understanding the flow of goods through a supply chain, through a, uh, the, the movement of goods domestically within a country and also globally um, in the context of international trade. So, um, uh, you know, I've, I've advised, you know, startups, I've um, invested in startups, I've built, you know, ventures and, and companies, whether it's in fintech or whether it's in, um, you know, healthcare related uh, entities. But my, my passion has always been in global trade tech um, and focusing on utilizing technology to create efficiencies in the way that people um, purchase and have goods delivered and fulfilled to them. Um, so, I'm a big products person, and, and, and in today's environment, if, you're, if you love products, you have to naturally love e-commerce. Um, we live in the digital age, and, uh, and, and, and purchases and transactions are moving away from brick and mortar, from offline, into more the context of e-commerce and mobile commerce, which is kind of a big craze, um, not only here in the United States, but internationally, right? Um, 
So I have offices in, in Korea, in China, and uh, we're setting one up in Brazil and Chile, and then um, we're looking to expand our footprint in, in the EU and Europe. And um, what, we're, what we aspire to do is help emerging brands create um, entry into new markets efficiently and quickly. <coughs> and so, you know, we've been working um, with various different types of products from apparel to personal goods to homeware to kitchenware to health and beauty to food and beverage, which, which we focus a lot on the last few years. And we help brands, we represent brands, big brands like Nestle and, and, and Hershey, but also emerging brands like the Barbara's Cookies, the Sensible Foods, um, those type of brands reach a global audience because everyone wants um, to sell to, 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 to new consumer base. And um, uh, the struggles that we've seen with small and medium-sized and emerging brands are distribution. So <clears throat> you can, you know, the holy grail back in the day was, you know, I, I make a product, I make a widget, or I make a, you know, clothing line or something, and, and the goal is to try to get into Walmart or Costco's of the world. Because if you got into Walmart, you were successful, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult path in terms of working with all the buyers and doing all the vetting and paying all the slotting fees and all of these type of things to get into a Walmart. If you're in, um, you know, they have a tremendous footprint, distribution, and your, your, your business will do quite well. Um, however, the difficulties in getting into mass retail have really put a lot of small business out of business on an everyday basis. So we work with the large distributors and large mass retailers from the Targets, from the Costco, from the London Drugs and, and Zellers in Canada to you know, Toys R Us in our you know, child and infant care lines. And we've realized that a lot of the small and emerging brands are trying to get to this holy grail of going to mass retail, but they really don't have what it takes to work with the Walmarts of the world or the, or, or, or the, the Walgreens or the CVSs because there's tremendous amount of inventory requirements, capital requirements, um, and <clears throat> they nickel and dime you in terms of all these allowances when it comes to margin. It is hard for a small business to survive. So naturally, a lot of these companies will sell to omni channels online, like the Amazons, the Etsy's, or the Ebay's. But eventually, sales will plateau as well. So they're looking for ways to grow. And the really only growth mechanism is global, right? Because 95% of the world's consumers live outside of the United States. So it doesn't make sense for, cons for product brands in the United States to just compete in bloody waters over 5% of the, of the consumer base, right? Doesn't make sense. So really the ability to scale your business, you have to transcend the domestic boundaries and go international. But the problem is a lot of companies, the small and the medium companies, didn't know how to do it. They don't have the right connections. They don't have the right relationships. And so what we've done over the past few years is help these brands reach new markets quickly and try to solve their problems. Jay, terrific stuff. And, and, and once again, folks, this is really your session. So I hope that all, and, and all the things that Jay is sharing, if you have a question or a comment, that you will be motivated to ask that. So we'll, we'll get to you in a second. Jay, you said a lot of great things, and I think it's, it's, it's always important for you know, our audiences here uh, to, to understand and appreciate. You know, the world is a very big place. Mm -hmm. So let's try to see if we can kind of micro-target a little bit here in, in Southern California. What would you suggest to, to, to students to be able to start pinpointing an area of the world or a region or a culture that helps them say, okay, I'm going to really immerse myself. I'm going to understand the language, the customs, mm -hmm. the traditions, you know, and the business practices. You know, 20% of the world's population is in China, but is it a place that's also very crowded? Are there other places that people here in Southern California should be paying close attention to? Um, gr great question. So I think Asia is naturally, because we're here in the Pacific, um, because a port, you know, we're close to a port that is the busiest in the United States and drives a tremendous amount of traffic from the Asia Pacific, that people naturally focus on Asia. Um, I think if you come from a certain ethnic background, you have some low-hanging fruit to go after, right? So if you're, you know, of Hispanic descent, uh, Middle Eastern descent, whatever it is, I think looking within your markets, you have some, you know, family or friends or network that naturally um, that you can you can target and go after. Um, I think you know, going to school in a in a in a pretty diverse environment and institution like Harbor, 
gives you an ability to reach out to you know other other student body that are diverse to be able to kind of understand which are good markets. So we sell to all all the major continents except Antarctica. <laughs> and um, you're telling me the penguins are not a yeah, big yeah, market for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we 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 on certain types of products there are certain uh, consumer bases and geographic areas that tend to gravitate. But all in all, I think you know we're pretty agnostic in terms of the geographic. Um, footprint. I think markets in and of itself all around the world are pretty, I, I'm not going to say pretty, I'm uh, not going to say mature, but they're all emerging and they all have um, tremendous amount of value that they can bring to someone who's looking to get into supply chain or an entrepreneur trying to create a product that they want to sell. Um, because of we're in the, this digital economy and this digital age, it's easy to reach consumers and consumers are becoming uh, more aware of trends of certain type of products that, uh, and lifestyle type of products that they want to gravitate to because of the mobile phone, because of initiatives that, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles of the world are trying to, you know, cr kind of, sh cr you know, shorten this digital divide to be able to allow people in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa um, having access to, to, to Wi-Fi and, and smartphones and having access to the internet, you know. And so everyone's going to be online. And so therefore, I think, um, to your question, going after the kind of cultures that are closely related to mm -hmm. you, I think are, are you, know, uh, you know, naturally kind of the, the, the best pathways to take. That's really terrific. So, so Jay, let's, let's get a little bit uh, deeper in some of the, you know, the wonderful array of brands that you talked about, mm -hmm. that you interact with. Talk to us a little bit, you know, you, you mentioned some of the emerging spaces and, you know, financial technology, fintech, and, and the like. What are some things, you know, obviously we all understand something that we, we touch, smell, taste, and, and, and feel, right? But what are some of those other kind of invisible economy type of companies that maybe people in the room can also be paying closer attention to as well? Um, I, I would say... There's a lot of buzz around technology. There's a lot of, uh, 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 um, you know, kind of buzz around um, students right now gr kind of gravitating traditionally before it was the finance field. Um, people gravitating towards, um, uh, you know, healthcare. <clears throat> I think two emerging, really emerging sectors are global trade in terms of global trade supply and logistics, which is traditionally not a really sexy field. Um, and we, Brandon and I talk about that yeah, all the time yeah. in terms of moving goods, UPS, okay, right. warehouse workers, et cetera. Right. But, you know, those are the, you know, that's part of the operations. Um, but there's um, going to be some, some revolutions in terms of how supply chain is done. And supply mm -hmm. chain is also, is, is basically meaning how to value chain partners within, um, within the chain of delivering goods from manufacturer or producer of a product to the end user, the customer. How does that work? How do you shorten the, these value chains in order, in order to make it efficient for, you know, goods, mm -hmm. goods to move? Mm -hmm. um, and then number two, I think, you know, an area that's really not talked about, you're going to see the next 20, 30 years is going to be really emerging is ag, is agriculture. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. agriculture, I think, is a really um, great category that, again, over the last 30, 40, 50 years has been non-sexy. No, no one wants to study agriculture, unless you go to UC Davis or something. <laughs> no one wants to study agriculture and learn about farming and all this type of stuff. However, um, you know, subsistence farming, producing organic products, health-based, you know, type of living products all come from that. And so people are, you know, you go to restaurants now, you know, they're, they're buying beef that's locally grown. Um, you know, uh, vegetables that are from farm to farm to table, you know, those type of things. So I think ag agriculture is going right. to be a really emerging market that uh, more and more people are going to gravitate to. And you're going to see some of the large, like the top universities who traditionally, you know, um, have students that, that matriculate into finance. You know, I went to, you know, Cornell and, in, 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 you know, in, in the East Coast, and a lot of East Coast schools, kids just graduate. They don't know what the heck to do with themselves, and they just go to Wall Street. You know, that's just a... They just matriculate just down to the finance industry. But I think more and more people are going to start, um, start moving into these non-traditional non, right. non right. careers, um, and there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity when it comes to both technology, manufacturing, and data science. So data science is obviously this big buzz, but a lot of these industries are using data to really make really efficient decisions on how to kind of disrupt existing, um, existing you know, 
producers, existing brands, existing processes and me Absolutely. methodologies. Absolutely. Almond grower, growers in California should, should feel good about yeah. that. So <laughs> uh, with that said, of course, here in you know, the epicenter, one of our previous speakers talked about how LA County is the epicenter of the, of the global trade economy. Uh, we can't forget our, our entertainment and our fashion friends. Uh, are you seeing that that's continuing to, to widening the market? I mean, yesterday as uh, we, we, we had an opportunity to hear from one of the big you know, entertainment brands, Disney, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that values that, but our independent filmmaking is, uh, and, 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 and uh, new designer boutique uh, apparel industry folks, are, are they finding global markets or is that part still very old and antiquated? I think it's absolutely going global. So if you look at one of the burgeoning markets in China, for example, um, they're talking about export of media or import of media. What are they talking about? They're talking about the entertainment industry in, a, in a, an emerging market like China growing vastly, right? So we were at World Trade Week and Disney was talking about it, but the phenomenon is really huge in terms of the, the, the entertainment in the, and the music industry within China. They're doing so many things in terms of you know, creating movies um, and expanding you know, uh, entertainment talent and, and artists and whatnot. And so they're, they're importing a lot of technology, they're importing a lot of know-how uh, from Hollywood, from all over, um, in terms of you know, getting access to intellectual property, um, copyright material, and, and figuring out how to really grow their internal market, because traditionally we think of China as kind of like this, this, this country of piracy, right? They, they take, you know, U.S. films and DVDs, and then they, they sell it on the streets. Um, but right now, they're really trying to grow, and they're investing a lot of money. So Alibaba, you guys all know, all know Alibaba. They're traditionally in trade and whatnot. Mm -hmm. They just set up an office in Pasadena, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that Pasadena office is focused on what? They're focused on yeah. media. So Jack Ma's looking to invest in, in, in growing um, connections with media. So when we talk about global trade, we're not just talking about products that UPS moves or FedEx moves or right. Staples or Office Depot. We're talking about intellectual property. We're talking about um, services. We're talking about know-how. And that's really where this, 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 this you know, idea of global growth in terms of trade <coughs> is really... Uh, it's really affecting you know many industries. So it sounds like, for what you're saying, there's a lot of direct and indirect jobs from marketing to finance to operations to mar to management that you know our students can really be thinking about. You know, political science, history, geography. Sure. All of a sudden, things that we didn't pay attention to in high school become very, very quickly relevant, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think focusing on you know. You know, global and, and global is this kind of buzzword that's been talked about, and, and localizing, which is taking kind of things in a global context and try to localize it to the local market. I think you know it's it's overused. However, um, there are so many opportunities because the world is getting smaller with technology, with the internet, um, and with 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 supply chains that we're experimenting with, but a lot of other uh, uh, big companies like Google and Amazon are experimenting with. Yeah, you know, things called uh, 3D supply chains and what we call the physical internet. So the internet traditionally, um, I don't want to get too, tech, too techy, but um, you know, TCP/IP is, is 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 the protocol that transfers data, right, from place to place, from through through Wi-Fi, through Ethernet ports, whatever. And it takes, <clears throat> you take a piece of data, you split it up, and it has headers and and all these type of things, and it takes, it looks at the, you know, how to move this data the most efficient route. And then at the end, it comes together, and then it delivers this, this media. So that's how the internet works. That's how the phone traditionally worked. So the idea of the physical internet is how do we do that with physical goods or physical services in which we break up things in a way and then deliver the, the, the product utilizing a 3D supply chain the most efficient way. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities, and, 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 and I think... Whether you want to go into marketing, whether you want to go into healthcare, whether you want to go into you know the services industry, um, you know the the the, globe, the field of, of global is is um, I think creating a lot more opportunities than we've seen you know over the years. <clears throat> We're seeing some sort of mature state. You know, 20, 30, 40 years ago even. Um, everyone wants to go global. Big companies were going global because they had the, the capital and the resources to do so. But small and medium-sized companies never were really able to take advantage of that. 
So it was just kind of a, a, a term that people threw around to look like they knew what they were talking about. But no one really, a lot of companies didn't go global because yeah. they didn't know how. And there, there weren't the resources and the systems in place for countries in order to, to kind of facilitate, um, uh, uh, you know, allowing multiple players to really go global. But now there are. Now, now, there, now there's a lot of things in place and infrastructure in place. And you're starting to see countries formulating, you know, free trade agreements um, and the whole TPP, right, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And, and there's other partnerships and alliances that are being forged that basically say, hey, we, we need to come together and allow the free flowing of goods and services, IP, know-how to each <coughs> other so we can share and help each other's, you know, constituents, which are business owners, um, access new markets and, and, and kind of grow business so that we can help prop up the global economy. So we see more of these things kind of being facilitated by the government. Um, there, there's you know, definitely more and more opportunity. That's terrific. So Jay, in a minute we're going to open up the floor and ask questions. And before we do that, I think that one question that might be on a lot of people's minds is as you are creating and advising these companies, what are the type of skill sets and the mindsets of the people that are coming and working in these environments and even perhaps uh, someday being able to incubate their own uh, business enterprise? What, what are you finding? <coughs> Great question. So I think skill sets going to college, um, you know, I, this may or may not, you know, be kind of in line with what Harbor's, their kind of mantra is. But the way I, I, I view college is you're coming out with, with some skill sets in critical thinking, in problem solving, in communications, in you know, working with others, team building, those type of things. Some people will call those soft skills. However, um, I think those are the most important things that come out of your, at least your undergraduate education. Um, you're definitely going to get a good knowledge base and a well-rounded um, you know, body of knowledge. However, you don't tend to come out of college <laughs> specifically with a like a really trade-based skill set, right? Unless you go to trade school or stuff like that, or you're really kind of, you know, maybe you go to school for accounting. There's certain, you know, exceptions to that rule. Um, so really, I think that's really important when we look at hiring, when we look at interns, is really their ability to self-learn. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. So in today's environment, millennials, they say they're going to have six, seven, eight careers in their in their in their kind of lifespan, right? And that's just while driving Uber, right? <laughs> yeah, so, right, right. So, right. So they're going to experiment with the with the you know the the digital, the on demand economy. There's all kinds of things. <clears throat> How are they getting these skill sets to be able to hop from career to career after two or three years? Well, I think the 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 willingness to to be disciplined and learn various things on your own mm -hmm. is really important. So self learning, I think, is really important. So there's you know, the digital platforms we talk about all the time, like, mm -hmm. you know, the Coursera's of the world or EdTech, the MOOCs, mm -hmm. um, the Lynda.coms, yep. the, yep. you know, um, you know, the Udemy's. Yep. They're, they're, they're democratizing education in a way that's, you know, that we've never seen, mm -hmm. right? So you, I, can learn, I can learn how to do financial modeling and reading a, you know, P&L statement and doing, you know, uh, doing a, a m and financial model without ever being a finance major, because I can go on Udemy and take a training course that lasts 10 weeks, right. do it completely online, and that's what, you know, kids graduating gold and Goldman Sachs are taking, mm -hmm. right? And right. it's 50 bucks, right? right? So yeah. <clears throat> accessing that information and knowing and having the drive to be able to create your skill sets and learn on the fly, I think that's a tremendous skill set in, in, in today's economy that I think a lot of employers will look at. <clears throat> on the technology side, we hire, you know, developers and computer science majors, and we, in a, they definitely embody this, this, what I'm talking about, because you know they, they're, they're learning a certain type of language or whatnot, and, and maybe we're, we're developing on a platform that they're, they're not used to the language, they're not used to, you know, the, the coding structure, the database, but they learn on the fly, right? We call it OJT. So the, 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 the OJT element, on-the-job training, is really important for them to be able to find resources and learn on their own and, and be able to solve problems in a way that aren't being directed. You should do X, Y, and Z to solve the problem. They figure out, I'm going to do A, B, and C. And so that, those type of skill sets, I think, are really important in terms of, you know, um, for, for, for young people coming out of, coming out of school.
That's terrific, Jay. Super. So now we're going to uh, direct our attention to all of the experts in the room, which are, which are you, right? We're going to be learning from all yeah. these fine folks, Jay. So uh, we'd like to open the floor. So if you have a specific question or even a comment uh, that Jay would be able to field, we'd love to hear from you. Please, and if you could stand up, just, just tell us your name and if you have a major or... or Perfect, welcome. Hello, and I was wondering what you're talking about, about the $50 uh, program at Goldman Sachs. Oh, so, so you can go on like Udemy or Udacity. Have you heard of those platforms? Yeah, yeah you can go on there and there's, you know, I know one, for, for example, it's called uh, like Training Bridge. And it's a company that they do a lot of corporate training and um, they have all of these assets in terms of video content. And they said, you know what? We're just going to throw all of this on Udemy right. so that anyone can access it, right? right? So going, going, to some, going to some of those um, online portals, you know, the, the elite colleges are, are, are offering free education, right? Yale. You can go to Yale's, you know, open, yeah. um, open, MIT. Ed, open, op, open up platform. Yeah. You can take their, yeah. you know, Econ 101 class that the Yale undergrads take for free. Right? You can go, like all the massively open online classes, the MOOCs. So, you know, MIT, the mm -hmm. Harvard mm -hmm. um, of the world, Stanford, Stanford of the world, edX, right? Um, Khan Academy. All of them are offering things, you know, Wharton, you know, UPenn, one of the, you know, the nation's, you know, one of the traditionally top business schools in the world. They're offering the first year MBA course from corporate finance to leadership to HR management to managing and leading global organizations. All of their first year curriculum is 100% free online. Mm -hmm. So you're taking courses that an undergrad that got into UPenn is paying you know, $150,000 yeah. for. Yep. Their first year of education is, I mean, is, is complete. Now, you don't get the degree that they get. However, you take the same exact courses with the same exact instructor taking the same exact classes for f complete, absolutely free. And if you want a certificate, yeah. you pay Coursera 20 bucks or something, yeah. right? So all of this is open. Right. Yes. So let's okay. say you finish that course. Uh, would you still consider a person without that, you know, uh, diploma mm -hmm. over, you know, would you, would you consider them at the same? So that's, a, so that's a good question. That's a hotly debated topic um, amongst um, companies these days. Like how do you, how do you, you know, how do you put the value on someone having that education versus someone belonging to the alumni network and actually having that piece of paper. Um, and a lot of students were up in arms when these things started opening up because they were saying, okay, well, this is going to dilute my education and it's going to dilute my degree. Um, but these courses, but, but uh, so I think it's, it's a work in progress. Employers still value, unfortunately, that piece of paper because they know that, number one, you've gone through and you were held accountable in terms of, you know, kind of finishing. And number, num uh, number two, you belong to a network. So a lot of corporations like the, you know, the higher kids from these schools for their talent, yes, but also they know that these kids have access to a network that could potentially help their business right. in terms of bringing customers, bringing BD business development opportunities, partnerships, whatever it is, right? So, um, so there's still a value there that someone taking these courses online don't provide. But I will say that in 20 to 30 years, I do feel that corporations will start valuing these, edu these type of education a lot more because for the main reason of cost. A lot of these kids going to business school, half the kids in, in my business school class were sponsored by their employer, meaning the employer said, okay, I'll allow, I'll, I'll, you, you're, you're middle management and you're a rising superstar. I'm going to pay for your education. I'll pay $150,000 and have you take two years off extend out your employment contract, so you're going you're to stick around more, but I will fork the bill for your education. A lot of more employers are going to realize the value of these courses and say, well, okay, I can not have to pay $150,000. take the same courses. I can just pay maybe a, a few thousand dollars and still retain these employees. Now, <clears throat> um, so from, from a cost standpoint, I think it could be, um, it, it will be extremely valuable um, for, for companies you know, moving forward. And not to mention there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room that may or may not necessarily, it's, it's about skills-based uh, competency, so they want to gain the skill. It's not about the paper. Yeah, it's not about that d degree or diploma, so. Yes, ma'am. what he was asking, so with that first year being free, um, same, same identical classes as if you were paying for those classes, 
does, are they still transferable like any other class? No. Can you then roll over into that second year of the program and pay for the second year? Like no, unfortunately not. There are just courses that are offered in which they have a camera that videotapes the course. You have access to instructors in terms of deliverables and, and you know whatever it is, but you're not formally accepted into the program. You're just it's just it's just a third party platform that allows you to take these courses to really do some you know some it enriches your 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 education. And they won't consider um, they won't consider the students that did well in the in those. No, unfortunately not, because because the students didn't formally go through the application process. Right, to get into Wharton, it's like their acceptance rate is quite low. So it's, they take the cream of the crop. So they're saying, we're going to open this to, to anyone who, who can take the course. However, those who are actually consider students in an alumni base and actually has a net ID or whatever, they're an accepted student. So they would have to take, if you have a student like that that actually took the courses for free the first year, and let's say just by fluke they got into the program, they would have to retake those courses all over again anyway. Most likely, right. yeah. Most likely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is, again, this is just so you can have a, a knowledge base. It's not that you can take these courses, have credit, transfer the credits, and then say that, hey, you know what, I kind of partially graduated from Wharton. It's, it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. inaccessible. And Jay is actually making uh, mention of a, a broader conversation we're having uh, at, at this college and other colleges is how do we do skills assessment, especially from private companies, right, who are going to eventually uh, employ you is what you are learning in the classroom, what is going to be applicable in the workroom, right? So that's, yeah. that's something we're, we're also So I think Brandon on. brings up a good point in terms of um, the value of this, of this education. So traditionally, you know, students look at the value of education as you know, the end point, right? It's a means to the end. I'm getting a degree, and that degree is going to help me in some way or another. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a shift. And people who are taking these courses are not looking at the degree, per se, mm -hmm. but they're looking at skills. Skills are more important than the degree. I mean, we've looked at people with great degrees that don't have good skill sets. Yep. And that's worthless, right? Or people without degrees but have really good skill sets. So this is a way to kind of transcend that, the, the, that type of... Um, the way people perceive traditional education. So um, a lot of entrepreneurs take these classes because they're not down the traditional pathway of going and getting a degree, whatever. They're trying to enrich themselves in the finance field because they're you know, manufacturing a product or they're creating some sort of service or whatnot. And they lack financial education or they lack you know, marketing education or they lack operations. You know, so they can take these courses and, 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 and still retain value. Now keep in mind, this is open up to the global environment, right? Because the, the internet is, is it's, it, you know, you can be a, in a foxhole in Afghanistan and, and, and take a class, right. I, I joke. So, yeah. um, you know, people from all over the world are taking it. And statistics have shown, for, for this Wharton program specifically, they've had more people enroll and take their courses um, over the last couple of years than the entire alumni base of UPenn Wharton. <laughs> Over the last couple of years, and, and Warren's been around for a hundred years. Yeah. Okay, so you're just seeing the influx of people who want to take the. Now, granted, the, the the completion rates tend to drop off quite a bit because they're not being held accountable. Because you know they have to self-discipline themselves. So some people take a course or here and two, and then they whatever, and then they don't necessarily kind of finish their program. But um, all in all, it's 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 accessible. S Sadly, Jay, this is something that our students won't like to hear. But tests matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> folks, more questions. We'd love to hear from, from, from more folks. Don't be shy now. You got a, got a real person who's interested in wanting to chat. I'm curious about um, your first business you developed your petition. You I can't talk about that. Oh, no, I'm okay. kidding. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Jay, before you begin, uh, could you please identify yourself? Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate it. So, you know, when I was a kid, I used to, uh, my mom was in sales. And um, she sold real estate. So she would go to, you know, with her friends, she would go to a lot of um, um, self-help seminars. The Tony Robbins of the world, Les Williams, Jim Rohn, you know. I don't, I don't know if you, mm -hmm. you know. You, the the rah-rah, you know, get 10,000 people in a stadium and, like, you can do it, you know, that type of thing. So uh, motivational speakers. So she would go mm -hmm. to those type of things, and, and I would tag along sometimes. 
And I would sit there and get mesmerized by these people because mm -hmm. they were like gods, right? They were sitting mm -hmm. there and people were like, oh, wow, you know, I can do it, I can do it. And so uh, a, a friend of mine who were, going, were, in, were in, uh, in, in high school, his dad would go to these things. So we would kind of like, we, we kind of got a fascination and we would sneak into these, some of these, mm -hmm. some of these um, educational things. And we met Jim Rohn, we met Les Williams. They were like, oh, we were always like the youngest kids, right? And so we're like, you know what? Amongst our friends, like, how come there's no motivational thing for kids? Mm -hmm. So long story short, we, we created a tape series called Thinking Big Enterprises, piggybacking off what Jim Rohn, Les Williams, and Tony Robbins of the world were saying, but for kids, mm -hmm. for adolescents to say, hey, you know what, steer down the right path, get an education. If you're trying to get an athletic scholarship, what are the, path, what are the ways to do it? And, we, and we, we sold that tape series to um, counselors of high schools and stuff like that who, who needed some peripheral things. That's, that's what we did. Yeah. I love it. Mo motivational Lego, I love it. Motiv <laughs> That's it, so very good. Um, some more, it, it, we're, we're coming up on that time where you have to go back to classes. But uh, w one, or one more question maybe from folks? So, so There's not a bad question, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, yeah, please. Okay. My name is Nell Pleasure. You know. Earlier you spoke about trade and how uh, what's being traded is moving further from physical things being traded uh, to like, uh, uh, like data, essentially, mm -hmm. um, intellectual property. Like, could you like elaborate mm -hmm. on that? Like, what do you mean? Like, is data itself being like sold and traded? So, so I'm, I wouldn't say data. I, when I say intellectual property, I'm talking about copyrighted products, like uh, like a movie, for example, right? A movie is is copyrighted, it's owned by the studios, whatever it is. Um, it's not a physical good. It's not a physical product. It's a digital good. So that digital good is something that is traded in terms of its licensing rights and, and all of these type of things. Software, for example, is also um, intellectual property based on a digital good. So you could create a software and it, you, you can license it or, or have distribution to many different countries who can then further upsell it to their customers or whatever. So um, there's a physical good which are widgets, clothes, whatever it is, and then digital goods, which are things like of things of value that are owned by someone, like um, like a movie, like music, for example, um, like software, um, like you know know-how, you know, uh, people license you know things that you know some sort of process um, of, for manufacturing or a mm -hmm. process for you know doing some sort of kind of graphics design or. Or user or UX, you know, design something of that nature. That's again digital in nature, and um, and, and and pass it along. Books, a lot of books, mm -hmm. a lot of educational type material are now all be becoming digital, and all of that type of stuff are copywritten. So that that's kind of kind of in the category of know-how in terms of being able to export that. Digitize your wonderful motivational tapes. Revisit that. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. So dust them off. Huh? <laughs> that's it. Any other questions or comments for Jay? Folks, we really, oh, wh one more follow up, yes, please? One more. Please. Just uh, speaking about patents and stuff, uh, I know there's a lot of uh, patent like, companies out there that help you patent uh, ideas uh -huh. and stuff like that. What are like, good start, like, startup ones that don't necessarily like, take your idea and then tell you won't, won't, like, tell you won't work and like, move further along with that and yeah. then you just find out later? So, that, so that's a good question, and, and you know, people in the entrepreneurial world discuss this a lot in terms of protection because you always want to erect some barriers to entry, right? So prevent some, someone stealing your idea or whatnot. Um, and there are a lot of patent trolls. So people that you know, get an idea or they think of someone has an idea, they patent it, and then um, they're, they're, they have no intention of actually creating the product, but they have the patent, so therefore whoever creates a product would have to work with them and license and buy them out or whatever. Um, you know, f obviously the best way is to go to a patent attorney. So there's a lot of, you know, good patent attorneys that would charge some sort of fee um, or defer some of their fees if they really like the idea um, to help you patent it. Um, there is no guarantee. There's two types of patents, a provisional and a non-provisional. Provisional, basically you file it. Basically it's, it's called, you know, first to file. You lock in that idea. So if someone wants to file it later on, you, have, you hold precedence. You have a year to file your non-provisional. Um, and you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of companies are filing patents, right? And, and some big companies like the, the Nokia, the Qualcomm's of the world, the value of their company is in their IP. They have thousands and thousands of patents. 
Apple has thousands and thousands of patents. Some of them they never build products for, but they just, it's, they, just they just own these patents. So you know, going to a patent attorney, there are some um, startup patent uh, or or patent you know, law firms or uh, patent agencies that actually help startups, so they reduce their fees um, to kind of to, to, to kind of buy you you know buy you some time. Um, so that's kind of the, the the kind of the traditional path. Of, of what should be done. But you know, definitely if you're an entrepreneur or thinking about creating something, that's one of the top things that should always be on your list is looking somehow protect your idea or protect your product. Uh, a lot of software companies are doing it, but um, the, uh, last year there was a, there was a big case um, in the Supreme Court that over, overturned a big software case, so now it's harder and harder to patent software. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it, it's definitely something that um, is, is, should be you know, priority if you're an entrepreneur building something. Terrific. Integrate, protect, promote, a lot of great big big idea concepts, Jay. Thank you so much. Let's give Jay a round of applause. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. And and that concludes our our coffee house series. Uh, thank you so much for coming and participating.